टीचर professor abdul qadir akhtar sir professor nehid abdul rahman of cardiology sir salim ali college hospital please uh, professor wajid sir please uh, say something regarding class sir sound sir it always on हेलो उटकम will find out surprisingly that non stay ami is worse so we should be much more aware of this fact and we should know as much as is possible about this and for exam it's also important professor abdul qadir akon uh, my elder brother and a very renowned teacher he'll be describing uh, about non stay ami is diagnosis management everything and you will be ready to ask a lot of questions both uh, in the chat box during the uh, lecture and after the lecture is completed you can uh, ask him questions directly uh, now i am asking professor abdul qadir akon sir to start his lecture thank you everybody thank you sir abdul wadu choudhury and dr mohsen ahmed to invite me to deliver a lecture on non Well, classroom sharing is available. Is that available? Actually, virtual classroom. It is a new experience in my life. Usually, we deliver lecture in classroom. only the students of cardiology attend the classes and it is little different because two renowned faculty professor abdul wadu choudhury and dr mohsen ahmed they are very academically very sound person the, in front of them i have to deliver the lecture this is the uh, little different and i welcome all the participants to today's lecture nst elevated myocardial infarction the non st elevation myocardial infarction is basically a part of coronary artery disease or part of uh, subset of acute coronary syndrome so the coronary artery disease so co coronary artery disease divided into acute coronary syndrome and chronic coronary syndrome so why the term is coronary artery disease the nst elevated mi st elevated myocardial infarction and all subsets of coronary artery disease produces ischemia to the myocardium but the disease nomenclature is coronary artery disease that appears as a misnomer so ischemic heart disease is better terminology than coronary artery disease because some myocardial ischemic events occurs even in the absence of coronary artery pathology so uh, 
before going to talk on non-estilevated myocardial infarction, I will give some highlights on the basic of the development of the NST-elevation MI. So all of you know the coronary artery disease and acute coronary syndrome includes the unstable angina, NST-elevated myocardial infarction, and ST-elevated myocardial infarction. And chronic coronary syndrome, in past we termed it as a chronic stable angina. So nomenclature recently changed by the ESC guideline and the differentiation between the unstable angina and NST elevation myocardium is very difficult. Very difficult because only the evidence of myocyte necrosis diagnose it as a case of NST elevated MI. But all the clinical presentation, all parameters, ECG changes may be similar in a patient of unstable angina and NST elevated MI. So in NST elevated MI, there are two components that interplace in the development of the myocardial infarction. One is the coronary artery, another is the myocardium or myocytes. So if we look at the incidence of the NST elevated myocardial infarction, then we can find that 1.4 million hospital admission in USA per year is due to non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. And in industrialized country, about 6% per 10,000 general population per year develops NST elevated MI. That means a 60 per lakh. And now it is found that the relative incidence of NST elevated MI appears to be increasing in comparison to the ST elevated MI because the incidence of non-ST elevated MI is gradually increasing and the incidence of ST elevated MI is gradually decreasing. So there is gap is gradually in increasing between the incidence of NST elevated MI and ST elevated MI. If we include the unstable angina and in elevated MI, about 80% of the patient of coronary artery disease suffers this subset of disease and only 20% develops ST elevated myocardial infarction. If we look at the etiological factor, that means the risk factor for the development of the atherosclerotic diseases that includes the old age, previous atherosclerotic Hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia, male sex, and family history of premature ischemic heart disease. These are the important risk factors for development of coronary artery disease. And there are many other factors as well, and also some novel risk factors are evolving as the risk factor for the development of the coronary artery disease. And this coronary artery disease may be associated with some sorts of valvular heart disease, may be associated with some arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies. If we look at the coronary blood flow, can anyone answer the how much oxygen is being extracted from the available blood in the myocardium, anyone can answer? Can anyone say how, it, how many oxygen is extracted from the available circulatory uh, blood in the coronary artery in resting phase? Can anyone? Do you hear me? Sir, can anyone? Yeah, can yeah. anyone hear? But nobody can. Uh, show, everybody are mute, sir. Okay, okay. okay then I have to talk by yeah. myself only. Yes, yes, sir. Everybody mute. So, the coronary blood flow and myocardial ischemia, 
we have to look for some parameters like the myocardial oxygen extraction in normal heart, normal resting phase, approximately 75% of the arterial oxygen content is being extracted from the coronary circulation. So it is only by increasing the coronary flow, we can meet the oxygen demand of the myocardial. Jamun exercise, fully exercise, any other cause that increases the myocardial oxygen demand, that demand is only met by the increasing coronary flow, not by the increased dissociation of the oxygen from the coronary artery. That is very important. And another important part is the anemia. Even with normal coronary artery, some patient with significant anemia can develop the feature of ischemic heart disease or coronary, heart, coronary artery disease. Because all of you know, the hemoglobin level is directly related to the amount of oxygen extraction from the lung. So as in, there is hemoglobin concentration reduction is there in anemia, that is proportionately reduction of the oxygen delivery to the myocardium in anemic patient. So some patient develops these you know, fissure of coronary artery disease in the absence of any circulatory obstruction. And major determinants of myocardial oxygen consumption is determined by the heart rate. As the heart rate rises, the myocardial oxygen demand increases. Systolic pressure, because systolic pressure determines the myocardial wall stress. More wall stress of the myocardium, more the demand of the oxygen. And left ventricular contractility also increases the oxygen demand of the myocardium. So these three important factors are related to the increased demand of the oxygen to the myocardial tissue. So among these factors, if twofold increase in any of these individual factors, Dhoren heart rate 50 ase, shape individual to the heart rate 100 hoy, that is the twofold rise of the heart rate, or systolic pressure twofold rise, or contractility if it is increased by twofold, anyone, a, anyone increased the demand of approximately 50% coronary flow. So to meet that demand, 50% rise of coronary blood flow is necessary. How it is being met? That is by the increased flow through the coronary artery that has got the capacity that I will say later because the coronary artery has got the capacity to supply about four to five fold. Even in Ganong, it was written that five to sevenfold rise, rising capacity of the coronary flow is there. By that capability, coronary artery cope with this situation to maintain the oxygen supply to the myocardial tissue. But in certain situation, when there is lack of oxygen supply, or if we stop the myocardial cell function, if we stop the cell function, even the low amount of oxygen, that means about 15% of the resting oxygen consumption, resting oxygen consumption hoy, that at least 15% oxygen supply rakte hobe, kizone to maintain the membrane function of the myocytes. Because if the myocyte membrane function is being disrupted, the cell is being destroyed or lost. So membrane function we have to maintain. That is used in cardioplasic patient in bypass surgery or valvular surgery like that. But if there is an ischemic change in myocardial infarction, only this amount of oxygen supply can maintain the cell membrane function and allow the cell to survive for certain period of time. And another function that should be maintained, one is the cell, function, cell membrane function, Another important function that must be maintained is the electrical activity of the heart. Fortunately, this electrical activation needs trivial amount of oxygen. The demand is very trivial, very low, very low. 
so very low oxygen supply can maintain the supply to maintain the electrical activity of the conducting tissue and if there is any incidence of ischemia the demand of conducting tissue decreases to maintain the electrical activity at very low rate so as i told that the coronary arteries cannot increase the oxygen supply by maintaining the normal blood flow so when there is exercise increase demand by any means the coronary blood flow increases that is the capacity in resting coronary blood flow under normal hemodynamic condition it is about 0.7 to 1 milliliter per minute per gram of myocardial tissue and can increase up to four to five fold by the vasodilatation so this rising capacity of coronary circulation of coronary artery is called the coronary reserve that is the ability to increase flow above resting value in response to pharmacologic vasodilatation why pharmacologic because the pharmacologic vasodilatation pharmacologic approach we can ensure the maximum vasodilatation by exercise we can cause some vasodilatation but is that is not the maximum by pharmacologic approach we can ensure the maximum vasodilatory effect of the coronary artery so aj maximum vasodilatation kore je flow baranor capacity that is called the coronary reserve and this coronary reserve is very important so we have to look for the hotter factors that decreases the coronary reserve if the coronary reserve decreases then the demand may not be fulfilled and the patient will develop coronary artery disease symptom in the normal coronary artery event and this factor that decrease diastolic time that is the tachycardia if there is tachycardia systolic and diastolic means cardiac cycle cardiac cycle is divided into systolic period and diastolic period if we consider 72 heartbeat then the cardiac cycle time is 0.8 second of which 0.3 second for systole and 0.5 second for the diastole so any rise of heart rate that reduces the diastolic period so tachycardia cost diastolic feeling so that decreases the coronary reserve preload rising also decreases coronary reserve and increased or vigorous contraction also reduces the coronary reserve so reduction of the arterial oxygen supply jodi kono karone arterial oxygen supply kume jay jemon anemia hypoxia lung theke je poriman hemoglobin oxygen saturation baranor kotha chilo if the individual cannot maintain that saturation then there is reduction in the arterial oxygen amount in the blood so that also reduces the reserve of the coronary reserve so what pathologic process that produces known as elevated mi all of you know that myocardial circulation starts from the epicardium epicardial coronary artery lies over the myocardium not inside the myocardium it lies over the myocardium karon eta myocardium er baire thakke je myocardium er bhitore thakle ki hoto je contraction of the myocardium cause squeezing of the artery that inter interrupts the flow so artery epicardial artery that's why term is epicardial it is remain in the epicardial region outside the myocardium and they supplies the branches from epicardial part to the endocardial part so any partial occlusion of the coronary artery first produces ischemic change in the sub endocardial region and if involves the whole thickness myocardium that is the transmural then it is called the transmural myocardial ischemia so in this situation in st elevated mi there is partial occlusion of the coronary artery that is the occluding thrombus partially occluding thrombus on 
disrupted atherothrombotic plaque or eroded endothelium. What is endothelium? Kono karoni erosion hoyse. Or pre-existing atheromatous plaque ase that is being disrupted. So it causes the accumulation of the thrombus in that, and that thrombus produces partial occlusion. And this thrombus pathology is little different because it is platelate rich thrombus. It is not the fibrin rich thrombus that occurs in total occlusion in ST elevated MI. That's why we do not use the thrombolytic agent in such situation. Second is the dynamic obstruction. Suppose the coronary artery has got mild coronary artery lesion, 20, 30%, that does not interfere the flow to the coronary artery. Sometimes it can induce spasm by any means, reduce the flow and produce ischemia. So this dynamic obstruction produced by the spasm of the coronary artery can produce an elevated tema if this spasm persists for a certain period of time to ensure the necrosis of the myocytes. Third is the severe mechanical obstruction. When, when the severe mechanical obstruction is due to progressive atherosclerosis, 80, 85, 90, 95, like this. So this kind of progressive atherosclerotic lag can also produce an elevated TMI. And another is the increased myocardial demand in presence of fixed epicardial obstruction, like if suppose a coronary artery has got 60%, 65, 70% that does not produce significant sim symptom at rest. But if this patient has got certain situation that increase the myocardial oxygen demand, then it is incapable to ensure the circulation. In such situation, what happens? There is ischemia. And if this situation persists for certain period, that can cause the myocardial necrosis, leading to fever, like fever, thyrotoxicosis, can produce NST elevated MI. And some inflammatory process plays the role in the development of the atheromatous plaque and ultimately NST elevated MI. So if you look, at the distribution of the coronary artery lesion in NST related MI, you will find that about 10% patient has got obstructive lesion in the left hand coronary artery. 35% has got triple vessel coronary artery disease. 20% has got double vessel and equal frequency is found in single vessel coronary artery disease. So, 85% there is definite obstructive lesion in the coronary artery, either single or in combined situation. But 15% of the patient, apparent critical stenosis may not be evident. So without significant coronary artery disease, the ischemic changes and ultimately NST elevated myocardial infarction can develop. That's why I told at the beginning, the coronary artery disease is basically a misnomer because the manifestation is by the involvement of the myocardia, not by the coronary artery itself only. So in a patient of NST elevated MI, if we look at the pathologic changes of the atheromatous plaque, you will find a lipid risk score with a thin fibrous cap. Thin fibrous cap means the unstable plaque. And clinical presentation, the clinical presentation in most of the patient presents with chest pain, sometimes present like heart failure leads to uh, shortness of breath. If there is any circulatory deficiency to the central vital organs like brain, by any means like arrhythmia and other things, bradycardia, etc., the patient might present with syncopal at attack as well, palpitation, etc. So mode of presentation varies according to the disease state and associated status of the patient. So most of the patient presents with chest pain of certain duration, short duration of chest pain, recent onset chest pain of severe intensity, 
that I will discuss in classification of the anginal pain. So clinical presentation, if we look at the clinical presentation of the coronary artery disease, 80% is due to unstable angina and NSTMI. That is the 80% patient, the presentation will be almost similar. And here only the enzymatic evidence differentiate from the unstable angina and NSTMI. And only 80% patient develops ST elevated MI. So if you look at the total distribution, 30 to 40% presents with unstable angina, 25 to 30% presents with NST MI. So if you look at the brown wall classification of the unstable angina or NST MI, they categorize it into class one to class three. Class one is the new onset severe angina or accelerated angina but there is no rest pain. This is important, no rest pain, but there is severe angina or accelerated angina. So it is new onset, it is unstable angina or NSTMI. Class two angina is the angina at rest within the past month, but not within 48 hours. That means within 48 hours, the patient is pain free, but he has got the experience of severe chest pain or anginal pain in the last month within 30 days. So that is the class two brown wall classification of the angina. And class three is the angina at rest. That is the rest angina within 48 hours. Investigation. Investigation is basically, all of you know, all you are doing duties in CCU, and you are receiving treating ST and NST elevated MI every day. Investigation means the clinical investigation is the key part of the diagnosis of the patient. And this clinical investigation gives the important clues to reach the therapeutic option. But along with this clinical investigation and routine evaluation of the patient, do not forget to assess the evidence of myocyte necrosis by troponin I. There are some inflammatory parameters like high sensitive C-reactive protein. Atherosclerosis acceleration occurs in diabetic, uncontrolled diabetic patient that can be assessed by hemoglobin A1C and blood glucose level. And vascular chains can be identified by the creatinine clearance and microalbuminuria. And ECG routinely will do ECG in every patient that can show no significant change in ECG or there will be significant ST segment depression and T inversion that is present up to 50% of the patient of unstable angina and NST elevated MI. And there is also trend ST elevation occurs in 10% of the population. So 40% of the patient of unstable angina and NSTMI, there is no significant ECG changes that you have to keep in your mind. Of the individual. And ST elevation, actually ST elevation means the transmural ischemia. ST depression means subendocardial ischemia. So if ST elevation is persistent, that is the ST elevated myocardial infarction. But in NST elevated MI, the ST elevation occurs and that is the transient elevation that causes ischemia, that increases the enzyme and it comes back to electric line within short period. So it is included in the non ST elevated MI, though there is ST elevation in ECG. Continuous ECG monitoring can help us to identify the arrhythmia and recurrent ST segment deviation because 40% ST segment is normal in resting ECG. So this continuous monitoring sometimes helps to document the STT changes. After the investigation, with this investigation and clinical assessment, we have to categorize the patient to risk group because this risk group categorization helps us to plan the 
therapeutic option and that should be assessed very quickly and very thoroughly we have to assess so among this risk criteria one group is the very high risk criteria those patients presented with anginal pain with hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock or evidence of acute heart failure these are the important group in this very high risk criteria besides the recurrent or ongoing chest pain refractory to medical treatment life threatening arrhythmias or cardiac arrest mechanical complication of myocardial infarction and recurrent stt wave changes particularly with intermittent st elevation these factors if found in one patient presenting with an stmi they are categorized as very high risk patient and that needs the urgent therapeutic intervention and second group is the high risk group and this high risk group is diagnosed by the rise or fall in cardiac troponin compatible with myocardial infarction and dynamic stt changes that may be symptomatic may be silent and if the grace score is more than 140 so these three criteria defines the group as high risk group and intermediate risk groups are those nstmi patient has got diabetes mellitus renal insufficiency with gfr less than 60 ml per minute and lbf less than 40% of conge or congestive heart failure if the patient develops early post infarct as in a patient had got st elevated mi in past and later on the patient develops the early post infarct as in a, that is also the intermediate risk group if the patient has got the prior history of pci or cabg and grace risk score is between 109 and 140 so these group are intermediate risk group who are the low risk group if the patient present with an stmi and does not show any fissure in intermediate high or very high risk group are the patient of low risk group criteria so if keeping these points in mind we have to set the key points of management of nst elevated mi one is the what are the key points the points are the early evaluation and ability estimation of the overall risk and by assessing this point we have to treat the patient according to guideline guideline je therapy amader option diyeche sei onujayi amra chikitsar chesta kori then selection of the nst elevated acs patient presents to the different settings if the patient presents with pci center first symptom first presents to the pci centers the strategy is one and if the patient presents pci capable then the system will be little different in pci capable center if the patient presents with st elevated nst elevated mi first we have to risk assess and stratify the risk accordingly as that i discussed if the patient is very high risk patient immediate invasive procedure should be considered in the patient and that should be done by 2 hours before 2 hours we have to do the invasive procedure if the patient is high risk group then we have to plan for early invasive procedure that is 3 hours to 24 hours ei shomoyer moddhe amader eta korte hobe that is the early invasive procedure in intermediate risk group the invasive procedure should be completed by 25 to 72 hours so that is the delayed approach delayed approach means the 25 to 72 hours period if the patient is low then you have to think you can think for the non invasive management of the patient but if you think 
the categorization of the risk factor of the patient, you can consider the invasive procedure for the patient as well. And that should be done within 72 hours. Or you will keep the patient on medical supportive management, you will evaluate and decide accordingly. But if the patient presents in non-PCI capable center, in very high risk patient, that should be immediately transferred to, high, to PCI capable center. When the patient presents with high risk in non-PCI center, same day transfer is required in this group. And intermediate risk group, that should be transferred by 72 hours. And low, low group transfer is optional. You can treat by local supportive management or you can ship to PCI capable center that is in the discretion of the clinician. So these are the guidance and lot of drugs you use in the managing NST elevated MI like antiplatelet, anticoagulant, beta blocker, S inhibitor or ARB, LOM and many other drugs, some antiarrhythmic drugs in certain group of patients, etc. But some drugs has got documented beneficial effect in a patient with NST elevated MI. Among those, beta blocker is one of the drugs that should be initiated early. Patient is on beta blocker, that should be continued. And it is class 1B indication. It is... Another is the decreased frequency and severity of the angina. So what is the effect? It is the indication is class one indication. On what is the effect? Effect is decreases the frequency and severity of the angina. And risk of myocardial infarction and death reduction. It is not clear whether it has got impact on the death reduction or death reduction or myocardial infarction developed reduction, it is not clear. Aspirin for all patients, it should be prescribed in every patient of NSTMI and it is class 1A indication. What is the impact? It decreases the risk of death, MI and stroke. In addition to aspirin, we can add another antiplatelet agent if there is no contraindication. And what antiplatelet agent you will choose? First, ticagrelor is the drug of choice, having class 1B indication to add with aspirin. Prasugrel is only that proceeds to PCI. Without proceeding to PCI, prasugrel is not indicated in a patient with an elevated MI. And this is class 1B indication. And clopidogrel, who cannot receive ticagrelol or prasugrel, or if there is indication for the anticoagulation therapy, in those situations, clopidogrel may be added to aspirin. This is important in this guideline. And dual therapy, if we use this, any sorts of dual therapy that decreases the outcome like mortality, stroke, and myocardial infarction, but at the cost of increased bleeding risk. Intravenous glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitor decreases the combined endpoint but decreases, increases the risk of bleeding. So this drug basically result undergoing invasive procedure. 
an unfractionate heparin or low molecular heparin with aspirin may decrease the risk of death or MI at one week, but benefit for long term is not clear. And low molecular heparin may decreases the incidence of myocardial infarction in comparison to unfractionated heparin. And unfractionated heparin and bivaluridine, bivaluridine is a direct thrombin inhibitor, has got the similar impact on motility and myocardial infarction. But bivaluridine decreases the risk of bleeding compared to unfractionated heparin. And regarding warfarin, there is no proven benefit but increases the risk of bleeding. So warfarin is not recommended in the treatment of NST elevated myocardial infarction. But if the NST elevated myocardial infarction has got the atrial fibrillation, that is the classic indication for the anticoagulation therapy. So in this group of patients, what could be the therapeutic option for this patient? Because we need anticoagulant how many antiplatelet agent or other will be used in this patient that is very important so for planning the therapy in this group we have to amosen jodi shunte oshubidha hoy tale amar mobile ektu phone diye janaen come on hello mohsen khub bhalo shona hocche excellent sir दारण other anti arrhythmic agent is not uh, not recommended in patient with nst elevation mi but digoxin can be used in some subsets we can use digoxin so to control the ventricular rate we have to prescribe beta blocker or digoxin to convert to sinus rhythm we have to prescribe amiodarone so drug of choice is amiodarone beta blocker or digoxin these three drugs so an atrial fibrillation special attention is towards the rate control prescribed anticoagulant agent so how we will manage this group of patient by antiplatelet so initially you have to divide the patient in two group one is the pca group and another group is medical management or patient is subjected for bypass surgery so if we treat the patient by medical approach or surgical approach then we will use oral anticoagulant preferably newer oral anticoagulant along with clopidogrel or aspirin so two therapy one anticoagulant one is antiplatelet so this dual therapy should be continued for at least 12 months if we go for the pci of the patient then we have to stratify the group in two group according to the risk of bleeding risk of bleeding can be assessed by the chart bar score there, there are different scoring system but if the patient is low or intermediate risk for bleeding then triple therapy one is the anti oral anticoagulant aspirin and clopidogrel mind it that in case of oral anticoagulant therapy aspirin or clopidogrel is the antiplatelet agent that can be used in combination no other antiplatelet agent is recommended to treat the atrial myocardial infarction along with oral anticoagulant so oral anticoagulant aspirin could be used in pci group of patient with low and intermediate risk for 6 month after 6 month either clopidogrel or aspirin to be added with oral anticoagulant agent that is the protocol that should be maintained for 12 months then after 12 months the discussion 
cardiologist that too, he will judge and adjust the therapy accordingly. But if the patient is high risk patient for bleeding, then we can prescribe triple therapy for four weeks. We can go for oral anticoagulant and one of the antiplatelet aspirin or clopidogrel dual therapy for four weeks um, up to 12 months. Possible, we have to prescribe the triple therapy for at least four weeks. So, with this information, of the therapeutic option, we will go for the intervention of the patient. And most important is the coronary intervention by PCI. So what is the aim of this intervention? The aim is to relieve pain and ischemic burden. It also prevents the death and myocardial infarction to identify the high-risk patients who need revascularization to facilitate the early hospital discharge among the low and medium risk group patient and to modify the risk factors and to prevent the post-discharge death, myocardial infarction and recurrent ischemia. With this objective, we intervene the patient for uh, patient of NS. Actually, this is very uh, widely available chart. You, if you open the book, you will get the recommendation in guideline. So recommendation, uh, I don't want to discuss in detail about the recommendation. All of you know the class one recommendation is the doing echocardiography to assess the LV and valvular function in to exclude the mechanical complication. Second is the immediate coronary angiography is recommended in patient with acute heart failure with refractory angina or ST deviation or cardiogenic shock. So if these parameters, angiography should be recommended and that is class 1B indication. And immediate PCI is recommended for patient with cardiogenic shock if the coronary anatomy is suitable for PCI. It is class 1B indication. Emergency CABG is recommended for patient with cardiogenic shock if coronary anatomy is not amenable to PCI. So in those situation bypass surgery, emergency bypass surgery is class 1B indication. Uh, if the patient has got mechanical complications with an ST elevated MI are immediately discussed by the heart team. So mechanical complication, that is not the straightforward management. That should be managed by the heart team discussion approach. And that is class 1C indication. Without heart team discussion, we should not should not go for any invasive or interventional approach. And if the patient has got hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock due to mechanical complication, in that situation, ABP may be considered. And that is class 2AC indication. But if the patient has no mechanical complication, but the patient develops cardiogenic shock, in those situations, short-term use of IBP may be considered. IBP or any other mechanical support may be considered in class 2B C indication. What those situations? That is basically to bridge the therapeutic option like intervention, surgery, etc. To subject the patient form for some treatment option we can do that but routine use of ibp or any mechanical support in 
cardiogenic shock without mechanical complication is not recommended at all. Another option is the chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease. In such situation, we have to assess the kidney function with GFR in all patients. Our next key is the administration of first line antithrombotic treatment should be as with normal kidney function patient. Tarmani, Jadir kidney function halo. Tadir Jeshomosto treatment plan Amra Kori for the patient of NST elevated MI. Surely we have to adjust the dose of that medication according to the kidney function. That is the class 1B indication. Therefore, depending on the degree of renal dysfunction, we will prefer the use of unfractionate heparin over other anticoagulant agents because function adjustment is very complex in low molecular heparin. Adjustment of the dose is complex and we have to adjust according to the kidney function. So we will prefer unfractionate heparin in a patient with chronic kidney disease. Same thing in fourth para, that is the unfractionate heparin is the anticoagulant agent of choice for kidney disease patient. If the patient undergoing an invasive strategy patient by normal saline. That is very important. So we have to maintain the hydration of the patient and that will prevent the progression of the dye-induced by contrast-induced nephropathy and deterioration of the renal function and prefer the use of low or iso-osmolar contrast media. But important thing is we have to minimize the use of contrast. We have to use the contrast as minimum amount as possible. If revascularization is required, then after careful assessment of the risk benefit ratio, in particular with the respect to the severity of the renal dysfunction, we have to decide. And in patient undergoing PCI, new generation days drug eluting stents are recommended over bare metal stents. That is class 1B. And bypass surgery should be considered over PCI. In patient with multivessel coronary artery disease whose surgical risk profile is acceptable and life expectancy is more than one year. So multivessel disease, surgical risk is low and if the life expectancy is more than one year, more than one year is a More than one year, then it is the bypass surgery that should be considered. But if the bypass surgery is high risk in multivessel coronary artery disease, and if the lifespan is less than one year, then multivessel PCI may be considered in this situation, we might go for stage procedure. So, a slide, but previously, heart failure rate slide, but just take to the key recommended. The slide with a deleted way, I guess. Heart failure slide. I'm very sorry uh, that uh, I prepared the lecture with the help of my elder son. So this is my first presentation with the preparation of the slide by myself.
and probably I deleted a slide that was with heart failure and NST elevated MI uh, that is being deleted in my preparation. Sorry for that. And that, that will remain as a homework. I think it will be a homework for the students. So my mistake can be compensated by the homework of the students. So in every patient, when we receive a patient, we have to explain the outcome of that disease with the risk. I asked my students and colleagues to go for the prognosis of every disease. Without knowing the prognosis, you cannot state the outcome of the patient in a rational fashion. Rational fashion, you cannot diagnose it in a rational fashion. That's why I request every student who are participating in this virtual classroom or any disease which you are going through. So in NST elevation, death rate within six months is 9 to 19 percent. Among these 9 to 19 percent, half of this patient dies within 30 days. So we have to describe the outcome of this death rate to the patient by the rational statistics. Otherwise, you can say patient will die, patient will not survive. These are not the statement. You have to state this is the percentage of patient chance of deterioration or death in this disease whatever the treatment option is. So we have to explain the prognosis. So before giving this prognostic statement, you have to look what are the factors that plays role in determination of the prognosis. There are some prognosis factors that determines the poor prognostic factors. Among these, severity at presentation. That is very important. This how severe chest pain and association is present at presentation is very important. That is the duration of the pain, severity of the pain, speed of progression of the disease. Is the patient is on heart failure or hemodynamic instability, or the patient has got recurrent anginal pain? This is important factor that indicates the poor prognosis. Second is the previous history of acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, or left ventricular failure. If the patient is 65 or more in age, that increases the risk. If the patient has got three or more risk factor of the coronary artery disease, their risk is high. And if the patient had significant coronary artery disease documented before this presentation. That is also a prognostic finding. And degree of ST segment deviation, ST depression, amount, number of leads. So summation of the ST segment depression determines the prognostic, gives an idea about the prognosis of the patient. An elevated troponin I, higher the level of troponin I, higher will be the risk of the patient. And if the patient is on aspirin more than seven days before presentation, on the therapy, the elevated MI, you have to think this fail to pre prevent the progression of the disease. That means the patient is on aggressive progression of the disease. So those are also important parameter for risk. So I have finished my job in virtual classroom and your work, your work will start from now. So I asked for two homeworks. I kept one for you, but as I missed by my inability of 
computer work that will be your homework as well homework is the impact of different therapeutic option on prognosis in nst elevated mi you all of you amra medical management interventional management and surgical management you will divide the patient in these three groups and you have to categorize the patient in the outcome of therapeutic option that is your homework and second homework is what are the approach to a patient of nst elevated mi presented with heart failure as i sleep or miss this slide that is your homework so with this homework i thank you all especially the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk over in virtual classroom and i experience i gathered the experience in this thank you everybody thank you sir thank you sir for your excellent elaborate presentation which covered all aspects of non stmi acs especially i am benefited from your presentation i thanks to the corona covid because unless covid i cannot hear your lecture so elaborate and i think you covered every aspects of non stmi acs sir thank you sir uh, Professor, sir, please, sir, uh, stop your screen, sir. Stop your screen, sir. Sir, could you stop your screen? Stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you again, sir. Uh, uh, I ask Professor Wadu, sir, please few comments, sir. Uh, the most important comment is that never hear a lecture that elaborated so much on the actual physiology, pathology, and the. Uh, the physical science the physics of the mi non stmi it is very important to understand why we are using particular approach what is the importance of anemia in a case of non stmi these things all are answered by what he has been presenting uh, that's, that's that's the most important thing i should say uh, second is a lot of questions as examiner uh, i am going to ask it that's very important because uh, professor kadir akund has given me the scope of developing new questions so students you should be careful <laughs> you should go through his lecture again and again the recording is being provided uh, later on so that you can actually answer many questions that will be given to you and now i think the audience is eager for asking questions let's go to that mohsin unmute mohsin unmute Uh, already there is some question already written in the question and answer session uh, i i'd like to take the opportunity to uh, go through this number 1 a patient with anstemi with atrial fibrillation had history of intracranial hemorrhage how will we proceed patient with anstemi with af and had history of intracranial hemorrhage how will we proceed very tricky question very sir. important question most then please sir so should i answer or someone will answer no sir you 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 sir answer please sir actually the intracranial bleeding that contra indicates the use of anticoagulants second is the nst elevated mi that demands antiplatelet and atrial fibrillation demands the uh anticoagulants so in this patient the management is very tricky and you have to decide on the spot by definite means you cannot arrange the treatment of the patient you have to categorize the patient the hot risk group the patient is is it very high risk high risk intermediate or low risk so if it is low risk then 
there is no hurry to go for any procedure that will increase the risk of bleeding but if the patient is very high risk group in that situation we have to intervene by balancing the risk and benefit in such patient can we i put in something look at the management of the uh, very high risk and high risk group of patient needs interventional management we prescribe three is in triple therapy high bleeding risk we use dual therapy and already the patient has bled already bled it so in this situation what agent we can use we should go for those medicine having short half life and after withdrawing the medicine the effect reduces keeping these possibilities in mind we have to prescribe the medication if low risk low risk coronary artery disease we will not go for the in this situation we can use the antiplatelet those are reversible aspirin is aspirin and clopidogrel produces its irreversible effect but if we go for the ticagrelol its effect is reversible if you stop the medicine by 12 hours the effect is over so i will prefer the antiplatelet ticagrelol as the treatment in such situation and we will go for the anticoagulant agent very cautiously if the patient is at very high risk and second thing is to reduce such situation sometimes the intact for intracranial bleeding with st elevated mi we prefer the primary pci in certain situation because we use heparin short acting heparin we can prescribe one or two antiplatelet one antiplatelet and one anticoagulant agent we can use but by any treatment option we cannot make it safe for all by any approach we cannot ensure the safety of the patient any antiplatelet any anticoagulant that will that will increase the risk of bleeding in the brain and third important issue is how much bleeding is there is it large bleeding or small bleed what part is being involved we have to consider everything is of the patient that is also important consideration so considering everything we have thank you sir you nice sir uh, i just as you information dr mohammad shahjan kobid he is our fellow but now is the faculty of medicine in the quest international university of malaysia sir shahjan kobid i am malaysia, i am his sir. student sir knows me i am in, i am his student he is the now sir, faculty sir. of medicine of malaysia uh, most of the student of the malaysia now his student is joined here one question from the tang sing yang i think please ask a question from the tang do you hear me yeah yes. sing, yeah i have yeah. a question here Uh, is there any difference in the management of unstable angina and uh, ST uh, non ST elevation MI? Uh, unstable angina and an ST elevated myocardium myocardial infarction it basically is the same disease subset. So same disease subset. An ST elevation is evidenced by the myocyte necrosis only. That is the only point by which you can differentiate the NST elevated MI and unstable angina. So okay. basically, the NST elevation is the severe form of unstable angina. So management protocol is. I of the stories in which I categorize very high risk, high risk, low risk. That unstable basically expresses a wide range of disease. Like if the patient presents with anginal pain of less than 30 days duration, that is also unstable. And if the patient develops the pain, 
compatible with angina, irrespective of severity is unstable angina. So management of that the NSTMI. That is not similar to NSTMI. But if the patient of unstable angina has got the severe without enzymatic evidence, there is dynamic STT changes, either ST depression or transient elevation of the ST segment. If the patient symptom is refractory to medical management, so in this situation, management is the invasive management. But in case of NST elevated TMI, the time frame has been defined, but that is not been defined in unstable antenna. But if you go back to your textbook, you will find that the management of the unstable angina and NST elevated MI is not being differentiated. Management protocol is same in unstable angina and NST elevated MI. Thank you, sir. Same. But it depends on the severity. And another thing is the management aggressiveness in NST MI is too prevent the development of the elevated MI. That is very important. And one important issue you noticed in incidents that ST elevated MI incidence is gradually going down and incidence of NST elevated MI is gradually going high. What is that reason? Because we are managing the ST elevated MI by aggressive approach, reducing the progression of the NST MI patient to ST elevated MI, so ratio is increasing. Sure. That is the basic. Uh, I, I have a question. If uh, there is no, no difference in the protocol of management, why we still need to classify uh, STS as unstable angina, ST elevation MI, and non-ST elevation MI? Why not just, uh, just for the management part, just ST elevation MI and non-ST elevation MI will do? No need to classify again as unstable angina. Uh, you get my question, Rob? Excuse me, I, I did not hear you. Uh, you if, if, no difference, if there is no difference between the unstable angina and the STMI, why is two categories to, to differentiate two categories? What is the importance of differentiation? Yeah. Definitely, definitely there is difference. If you look back to the pathophysiology and pathologic changes, the most important pathology in NSTMI is the acute development of the thrombus, non occlusive thrombus. In NST elevated MI, there is no occlusive thrombus in the coronary artery. There is no thrombus formation. There is the stab rapidly that is another so definitely there is definite difference in the NST elevated MI and unstable angina. So on the basis of this pathophysiology that is necrosis of the cardium. So that the moment of the NST elevated MI is very aggressive invasive approach. But unstable angina only those group of unstable angina has got very severe occlusive coronary artery disease that is rapidly progressive, but there is no development of the thrombus. That is the difference in the physiology and pathology of the coronary artery. That Excellent. made the difference in ST elevated MI. In ST elevated MI, the management can I, can I is something? more aggressive. Yes, sir. For this, sir, can I put in something? Uh, we should not differentiate that these are totally classified in different categories. These are a continuum. You have a stable angina that may become unstable due to certain reason. That may continue into progress into non-STMI. That may progress into STMI. The thing is, though they are the basic pathophysiology start from the same point, the outcome is different. For unstable angina, you have a level of problem which may be, patient can be very easily treated 
at OPT, at emergency. And then with, if the risk factors is not there, high risk features, the patient can be sent home. You don't have to worry about it. For unstable angina, you can do that. For a non-STMI, that is myocardial necrosis. That's the point. Unstable angina, you don't have myocardial necrosis. Non-STMI, you have myocardial necrosis. It's already in the high risk group. And the higher the troponin, as Professor Kadir has already mentioned, the higher the troponin, the higher the risk. And the, 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 the patient is already in the high risk group. Troponin is high or other features of failure or other things are there. There's a very high risk group, but it's already high risk. So the treatment should be more aggressive. That's the point. As I would ask a question uh, to the student, uh, if somebody wants to say, what are the other reasons where without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we can have non-STMI? Dr. Shudir, do you hear me? Yes, Without sir. atherosclerotic yes. cardiovascular disease, we can uh, have non-STMI. This, this, this yes. question has already been answered by uh, Abdul Qadir Akandosta in his previous slides, that if a patient is having a mismatch of the uh, uh, demand and supply, he can, he can manifest as non-STMI or uh, angina cell. So those causes, like a patient having severe anemia, so he, he could not be able to meet the oxygen demand. And so he can have these uh, complaints. And? And, and others? Why? Others? Anybody? Why? I'm putting this question because in this COVID pneumonia, Yes, we sir. have a lot of tropidize yes. that myocardial injury may, uh, is, can be classified as uh, STMI or non-STMI. But pathophysiology may be type 1 MI where there is actually plaque rupture, uh, occlusive thrombus and MI, occlusive or partial occlusive. Or there can be only mis mismatch of uh, supply and demand. How is that? The patient already has pre-existing narrow coronary artery. Now there is hypoxia. Now, now there, because of the pneumonia, there is high uh, workload, hyperdynamic circulation, tachycardia, but oxygen supply is low. All this can lead to type 2 MI. We can have the presentation will be then, that's the pathophysiology. The presentation will be non STMI or STMI. Because of this COVID pneumonia, we have to understand for the treatment perspective, what Is, uh, am I going to go for invasive uh, procedure or am I going to do uh, aggressive medical management? Uh, Professor Adod raised a very, very important, important issue. All the students should know what are the known cardiac cause of Dr. Mohsen, Shonajai. Yes, sir, Shonajai, sir. All the students should know what are the known cardiac cause of elevation of the troponin I. So in, in my lecture, you have to know that if myocardial occurs due to ischemia, that is NST elevated MI. If the myocyte necrosis occurs other than myocardial ischemia, it is not NST elevation MI because it is coronary artery disease. Like COVID era, there is myocyte, myo, uh, uh, myo myocardium may be involved and that can cause the myocarditis. This myocarditis also can cause the raised troponin I. Second thing, in COVID, there is development of the septicemia. Septicemia is a very strong cause of elevated troponin I. So all of you should know what are the possible causes of Troponin I elevation other than coronary artery disease. That should be noted. And regarding the occlusive disease, in 15% NSTMI, there is no occlusion at all. That, that may be the coronary artery spasm. And first pathology, they state that one is the atheromatous plaque disruption, another is the erosion of the endothelium of the coronary artery. So Obstruction may be 20, 30 percent. There is erosion of the plaque, or that can also lead to subtotal occlusion and NSTMI. So those group of patients may not be 
may not follow the same path as stable, unstable, and NSTMI, NSTMI. So we have to keep all our windows open uh, to uh, decide the management of this, this group of patients. Even then, keeping everything in mind, we'll face some trouble that have to manage on the spot. Thank you, sir. So after Janat Jano both sir, I can tell you, I can give them lots of faculties in front of us, senior faculties. Professor Majumda sir, Shabuddin sir from Silet, Khalid Mohsin sir, Professor Mamanushi Sijar, Abzal Raman sir, lots of uh, teacher are here in your lecture. I think so, uh, Professor uh, Majumda sir with us, such few comments from Majumda sir. Sir, do you hear me? Hello? Okay, uh, uh, Shabuddin sir, please. Professor Shabuddin. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kadir Akhand. He is my direct teacher. He has presented uh, unstable engine and on STMI very nicely here. So, every aspect uh, have been uh, discussed very elaborately according to the postgraduate students' standards. Standard. I think uh, he is a good teacher and he has delivered his best lectures. Very simple thing I want to add in uh, addition to uh, Dr. Abdul Qadir Akhil that in unstable engine, it's a simple engine, and in non STMI, it's a uh, variety of MI, though the ST segment is not 11. Another uh, differentiation point that you have already been. Thank you, Kadir Bhai, once again for your nice. Thank you, thank you, Shaudan Bhai. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ashiku Rahman, Dr. Ashiku Rahman, do you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you, sir. Uh, yo, you ask a question. Ask a question. One what? question among uh, point question. Just point at the question, okay? Sir, sir, I have two questions. First of all, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Abdul Akhandu, sir, for a nice presentation. Uh, for my first question is, in a patient, who comes with non ST elevated MI or uh, uh, unstable angina and uh, new onset atrial fibrillation, which persisted for a transient, transient period of time and with the treatment of unstable angina, the patient's atrial fibrillation is uh, spontaneously converted into sinus rhythm. And on the uh, categorization of the unstable angina or uh, non STACS, uh, the patient was. Um, sent for invasive strategy and stenting was done. So in this case, for the transient atrial fibrillation, should we continue oral anticoagulant for 12 months or uh, we have to have a different strategy? And my sir, second question is... Uh, only, please answer one question first. question is... Yeah. Your first question is transient. Transient AF during unstable angina. Yeah. Patient gets settled down. But whether we should continue the anticoagulation long time. Unstable angina? Unstable angina or NSTMI? Uh, non STMI with transient period of atrial fibrillation, which is converted into sinus rhythm with the treatment. And the patient was uh, sent for PCI and stenting was done. So while stenting was done, patient uh, patient's atrial fibrillation is already recovered. So in this case, we should continue the anticoagulant uh, for 12 months, or should you have another uh, new strategy? Uh, do you hear, sir? No. Sir, for this, sir, you can answer. For this, sir, you can answer. Point? Uh, can I answer it? This yes. is not recurrent AF. This is paroxysmal transient AF, not even paroxysmal, because it's not recurring again. So the need for continuing anticoagulation actually doesn't arise, because the patient has non-STMI already gone for PCI. 
PCI done, reverted to synesthesia, it's not recurring. So the chances of recurrence of atrial fibrillation, unless the patient have other pre-existing uh, uh, valvular lesion or other things, is low. No, you don't have to do anticoagulation. But if the patient has previous history of AF, and this is a recurrent paroxysmal AF, then we may consider using anticoagulation. Then comes the point. I'm using DAPT plus oral anticoagulation. That will be triple anticoagulation, antiplatelet anticoagulation. It will be a problematic thing. What should we do? The study says, or guideline says, if you will have to uh, use anticoagulation along with this, use clopidogrel and aspirin. No other antiplatelet with uh, 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 preferably epixab. So the chances of bleeding risk is low. And use it for one. Then stop one antiplatelet. Continue one antiplatelet and after 12 months, assess whether you need to continue the anticoagulation or not. And you may stop oral antiplatelet totally with continuation of oral anticoagulation at full dose thereafter, depending upon the situation. And all these cases has to be considered. The risk of stroke is how much? The risk of bleeding is how much? That you have to consider. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bhavani Logan? Dr. Bhavani Logan, do you hear yes, me? Sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Sir, I have two questions here. So I'll start with my first question. So uh, what is the difference between TME? Yeah. So which one is more acceptable, sir? Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. My question is, what is the difference between TME scoring and GRAY scoring in MI? Which one is more acceptable? Yeah. Other bhai? It is my case is good. Yeah. It is a big, big chapter. So I your question is TME scoring and GRAY scoring. Okay. Yeah, which yes. is, is yes. more yes. appropriate in uh, honesty of mine. Hello. Yeah. The counter, counter important, sir. Can you, can you see? Yeah, yeah. Sir, can, can scoring they... is team scoring is on the basis of coronary angiogram. And gray score is the clinical scoring. So in NST elevated MI, we use the gray scoring. Gray scoring for the clinical judgment. Sir, Timmy scoring also sir, clinical judgment, sir. Timmy score, sir. Timmy score in, in, in guideline, the gray score is very simple, well accepted, and most of the guidelines recommended the therapy on the basis of. Hey, 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 sir. Sir, I think add something? multiple scoring system. There is a Timmy risk score, uh, there is a seven point scoring system. If the patient has got, this is called a uh, high uh, honesty, yes, yes, yeah. The, the, the seven point score. Uh, Mohsen, I just uh, want to just uh, actually uh, non PCI capable centers being observed that the patient with a significant dry uh, cardiac biomarkers have coronary angiogram. I want to have the opinion of the panelists regarding the use of CT coronary angiogram, particularly in the patients who are going to need a further coronary angiogram. The radiation dose and the contrast load is likely to be doubled. So I want to have the opinion of the panelists. And uh, as Dr. Kader Akhan, Dr. Wadud, you are working in a multidisciplinary hospital. Uh, non STL elevation MI following a major surgery. So, what will be the approach to this group of patients? Uh, I just uh, want your opinion. Can I ask uh, uh, supplement something uh, regarding the questions of Bhavani Lagun? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, the the Timmy score and uh, Grace score both are the uh, risk stratification score for the patients having unstable angina, non STMI and STMI. In case of uh, management strategy, the uh, complex strategy that means the uh, antiplatelet, anticoagulant, and the most commonly the repercussion strategy are applied to the patients uh, when they are is a high risk category. If you consider uh, uh, when regarding the GRACE score, it, it is more than 140, it is indicated that uh, you should go for uh, invasive strategy. In other words, if the in-hospital mortality is more than 9%, according to GRACE protocol, you will have to proceed the invasive strategy. And in case of uh, TB score, uh, this is a simple score you can contribute very easily uh, by age six and multiple risk factor presentation or uh, one uh, uh, ECG presentation that is ECG change, enzyme change and patient taking the aspirins and the uh, multiple uh, when that is, is a, a, uh, enzyme, uh, angiographic findings on uh, a, a, a plaques or the ECG or not. Depending on these factors, they have uh, scored the 19, uh, seven points that has already been asked, uh, asked by the uh, and if it is more than uh, three, it's uh, uh, more or more less uh, the intermediate group, and it is more than five, it is high risk group. Again, you can uh, many calculate again in this way to a, a risk stratification gr group. And GRACE protocol, it is a computed protocol. You can uh, just uh, come and input your presentation, uh, the some several markers that is uh, the chest pain, ECG change, and the a uh, clave classification presentation one um, uh, presentation that is black pressure yes uh, black pressure but, taking idea and uh, cardiac arrest on presentation or not these are the nine parameters that have individual score and you have to calculate the uh, invasive procedure. So the, both these systems are applicable for risk stratification. The best things that we which systems you are very much accustomed to. It. Thank you, sir. Uh, good. If you can apply the TMI protocol, it's well good. It depends on your excellency that which protocol you can use. But besides this, it is the it is the in your, in your clinic, uh, clinical judgment that patient with hemodynamic instability and to ventricular fibrillation, dedicated activity and refractory to medical management and mechanical complications, that will go for early invasive procedure, whether it is STMI or it is non-STMI or unstable engine, whatever it may be. It is the clinical status. I think I have cleared uh, these things. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, if anyone, what, if what anyone can supplement what, this, I can do it. What is that? Uh, what is uh, uh, ask question. Look at this. As a question, I ask has asked a very valid question. When there is already tropa is positive, there is among I, I am uh, quite sure it's related to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It's not due to CKD. It's not due not due to severe anemia. It's not due to carditis. Then why should I go for CT and you? I should go for coronary angiogram. His question is very valid, and this uh, this type of injudicious judgment is being sometimes done. That's very very uh, unfortunate. Second is I want to add something. Uh, I want to ask. I sometimes ask my students is is taken as a risk factor in the risk scoring system. Why? Hello. Can somebody can somebody answer that from the student side? Why <coughs> previous use of aspirin is taken as a risk factor? Bhavani, Logan. Doctor Bhavani, do you hear me? I don't know, sir, but maybe it will cause bleeding. Now, what are the important risk distribution? TB score, AC score. What is the importance? The patient is using aspirin. You should praise him, but. We are finding out if the patient has the aspirin, is a history of use of aspirin, but it's a bad prognostic factor, it's a risk factor for him as 
पीसीआई in nst elevated mi otherwise it is not indicated they prefer ticagrelol if we add any other antiplatelet agent to aspirin first choice is the ticagrelol second choice is the prasugrel if we proceed for pci and propidegrel is prescribed for those group of patient who cannot tolerate ticagrelol or prasugrel or the patient needs anticoagulant because if the patient needs anticoagulant only the aspirin and clopidogrel is the antiplatelet agent that we can use and if the patient on professor adud already explained very nicely the seven days aspirin is important because it is the rapidly progressive disease in nstmi the thrombus is platelet rich thrombus not the fibrin rich fibrin risk is in st elevated mi but platelet risk from elevated mi if antiplatelet agent fails to stop the progression of the disease so it is aggressive thank you sir dr akan can it, can I, can can I it signify it i think the fact is that is is this is a, a virtual classroom the faculties will contribute their <laughs> knowledge and share the knowledge with the students thank you this sir this is the this is the benefit of the student beyond the lecture dr tanvi then, then the students me? cannot ask anything yeah dr tanvi do you hear me uh, and I, uh, on antiplatelet can i add something uh, yes, yes, yes 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 uh, one of my the one of the <clears throat> question i asked to the students is that they uh, Strength. The most powerful is prasugrel. The second is ticagrel. The third is clopidogrel, and the lowest powerful is aspirin. Prasugrel is very powerful. Be careful with it, and it has more restriction. Therefore, clopidogrel is effective. The problem is it's a prodrug, and there are many people who are clopidogrel resistant. Variable response. Otherwise, it would have been a very good one. One important is the answer question, sir. And also the reversibility and irreversibility. That's the problem. That's the point we should make. Doctor Tanbi, yes, sir. Ask your question, Tanbi. Send uh, the question. Thank, uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, nice presentation. Sir, my question is why double antiplatelet is used in uh, acute MI, not single single antiplatelet. Uh, second question yes. is uh, why, sir, uh, 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 loading dose is given. 
Why not 75 uh, milligram is given in ecotemize? Okay, thank you. This very simple question. Uh, yeah. So the answer is very simple. Loading yeah. dose for the rapid onset of action. If we prescribe the routine use, it takes long time. So you have to prescribe the loading dose to shorten the onset of action, number one. And number two, in my slide, you noticed that adding some antiplatelet with aspirin reduces the outcome, like mortality, MI, and stroke. A <coughs> risk reduction. Prescription is made to reduce the unfavorable outcome. Uh, can I, outcome. Can I add something? Yes, sir. Can sir. I add something? Yes, sir. Uh, that's a very important, very simple question. Every drug has a half life, and every drug needs time to exert its full effort. The half life to achieve a reasonable level of action. And that's why we give the loading dose. Because otherwise, if you give the maintenance dose, you will take four days to reach that level, or five days, or six days, or two days. Loading dose is given so that you have a reasonable level of action. So with the, with the first dose, that can start. And then you can maintain it. And the yeah, second is, studies have shown adding antiplatelet, as uh, 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 Professor Kadir has already seen. Adding antiplatelet, cure PCI, or uh, the cure strategy, reduces mortality. The first point is to reduce mortality. Second point is reduce morbidity. Both of these are achieved by addition of an antiplatelet with aspirin. That's why we do it. Thank you, sir. Uh, last question, Dr. Shudir. Dr. Yes, Shudir. sir. Uh, you Thank last you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Indeed, an excellent class. My question goes to Professor Abdul Wadud Chaudhary, sir and Abdul Qadar, Abdul Qadar Akandu, Akandu, sir. So I will uh, say one by one. My first question is, can a patient, can a patient of non-STMI ha have ST segment elevation? And if yes, by what mechanism? This is the first question. Why early coronary angiogram and intervention, that is within 24 to 48 hours, are not advised in non-STMI, unless and until it's complicated by failure or cardiogenic shock? Please repeat your question because you are, uh, we cannot listen you uh, okay. very clearly. Number one question is, can a patient of non-STMI have ST segment elevation? And if yes, by what mechanism? One number question. one. Okay, number so, one. So, question to the number one. Yeah. First, I will ask you one question. You will answer the question, then I will answer your question. What is the meaning of ST elevation? What is the meaning of ST depression? One patient, there is a elevation. One patient, there is a ST depression. Do you understand what is the meaning of this? So it's an uh, electrocardiographic criteria. ST elevation. What is the meaning of ST elevation? There is acute occlusion of the coronary arteries. Not acute. That, not that acute. Is, not chronic. Like full occlusion. What? Total huh? occlusion. Transmural ischemia oh, and subendocardial ischemia. Yes. First yes. thing you have to understand that ST elevation means. There is transmural myocardial infarction, uh, ischemia. It is ischemia. not the infarction. ST elevation does not mean that there is myocardial infarction. ST elevation means transmural ischemia involving the epicardial artery. Yes, Number one. Number two. The subendocardial region suffers from ischemia. And this subendocardial ischemia is represented as ST depression. So ST elevation and ST depression in ECG is empowered only to describe ischemia, not myocardial infarction. So if a patient with ST elevation that persists for a very short period, that means that sub, sub occlusive lesion is going to produce almost occlusive lesion. Again, the circulation is being established. So transmural ischemia is again disappearing. So transient ST elevation is a component of NST elevation myocardial infarction if there is enzymatic documentation. 
but if there is no enzymatic documentation of the myocyte necrosis it is not myocardial infarction at all second thing is the st depression elevation eta to amra ett korteo to st depression ashe unstable angina transient st depression ashe that is not the myocardial infarction so that is not the evidence of myocardial that's why nstmi transient occlusive lesion produces that uh, changes should we second question sir uh, can, can i add can, can i add yes yeah, shahabuddin sir shahabuddin sir ah bhai okay sir uh, I mean, regarding your questions, the, how the non-STMI can uh, transfer to uh, my transmuted to, to STMI? No, no, no. This is the question. Dr. Kader has already been explained. That is nicely. But the simple thing is that it's a dynamic process. Turn into the oculocytic thrombus and may subendocardial MI may turn into the moral MI. And so there is the elevation of the myocardial uh, elevation of the ST segment. This is the main mechanism in, it, in its pathophysiology due to its dynamicity. Thank you, sir. Thank you. A another can explanation I, I, of the ST elevation is there. Mohsen, just a moment. Okay, another sir. explanation is there. If you do the angiogram of the an ST elevated myocardial infarction patient, about 20% patient shows total occlusion. 100% occlusion is found in 20% patient of NST elevated MI. And this 100% occlusion does not produce ST elevation, it goes to ST depression or no ECG changes. It may be due to presence of collateral. So yeah. if there is sudden occlusion of the coronary artery, collateral might reverse that transmural ischemia. So transient elevation can be occurred in that mechanism as well. Thank you, may sir. I add, may I add, I add, uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have already two hours. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, actually, another pathophysiology Dr. Kader has mentioned, the spasm is a very important yeah, yeah. component. Spasm. Right? The spasm, uh, it is uh, caused by the mediated release by the platelets. And this, due to this spasm, that there can be some transient ST elevation as well. Okay, thank and you, sir. Please yes. tell angina sometimes presenting with the uh, enzyme rise. So you get transient ST elevation, there's normal uh, ECG again, but you are getting enzyme rise. That becomes non stmi That can happen. But the second question, should it? Yes, sir. Quick, uh, quick, quick, quick. Sir, I have, I have one more question, sir. Please give me an opportunity. Sir. Okay, sir. Two, one. Quick. Uh, why early coronary, and, coronary angiogram and intervention that is within 24 to 48 hours are not advised in non stmi unless and until it's complicated by failure or cardiogenic shock. Is it true? Sir, uh, guidelines is saying the same thing. So uh, if even in guideline for the invasive procedure in STMI is very clear. Very clear. Very clear. Yes, very clear. Yes, there is no shadow of doubt. But what you can tell that we cannot adopt the method because of unavailable service system. Yeah. That may yeah. be the reason because the invasive procedure is very clearly described in NSTMI, very clear. And the time frame is also described. Very high risk, within two hours, we have to go the procedure. Yes, very high, high risk, risk, then three hours to 24 hours. If it is intermediate risk, then 20, money, 25 take 72 hours. So invasive procedure in NSTMI is finished. Finished. Right. If the low risk group is managed medically, we can take the decision later on by other evaluation. So NSTMI, the decision is very clear regarding the invasive procedure. Can I add something? Yes, sir. Our goal is to prevent TMI. Our goal is to prevent morbidity. Now, not all NST, NSTMI are saying a post-operative patient developing MI because of the uh, loss of blood, loss of due to anemia, tachycardia, pain, etc. Conservative treatment is the choice. Most of the time, only with conservative treatment, the patient will get stabilized. You can go for invasive procedure later on. 
if we go for uh, uh, in, invasive procedure in all the non stemi patient, some of the patient will have worse prognosis. That's the point. You have to have a justification why you are putting in an invasive procedure. If it is not unequivocally good for you, you should be careful. Thank you, sir. That's the point. Dr. Arif, uh, please read the question. Uh, which ask in the chat box by the participants. Dr. Arif Shajal, Dr. Arif Raman Shajal, please read the question asked by the participants in the chat box. Shajal Anur. Sir, sir, there are lots of questions. I am asking only few of them because we are in shortage of time. So one important question is uh, the what will be the management strategy in this situation? Or thrombocytopenia due to any other cause. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. In thrombocytopenia, we have to mention what is the level of thrombocytopenia. Yeah. On yeah. that basis, we have to decide. In in such situation, there is no clean cut guideline for the management of the patient in in this situation. In this situation, you have to weigh the therapeutic benefit and risk of the therapy and by judging these two point you have to decide what decision you will take if the platelet count is less than 10,000, definitely antiplatelet should not be prescribed in this group of patients but how do you manage if you give the unfractionated heparin that will cause thrombocytopenia as well so we have to balance the need of therapy and risk of therapy according to the platelet count we have to adjust Next question. There, uh, there is also uh, another can question. I, uh, right, can, can I add sir. something? Can yes, I add? sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the guidance is that if the count is between 100,000 and 150,000, you can use dual antiplatelet, but under observation. If it is below 100,000, above 50,000, you can use single antiplatelet. Below 50,000 or uh, around 50,000, you should not use any antiplatelet. Can, can I add a word here? Yeah. Uh, we must remember that clopidogrel itself can cause thrombocytopenia. So in thrombocytopenic situation, it is better to avoid clopidogrel. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Right. Adi, next that question. Is Sir, that is important. Another question is, so what is the problem if you use thrombolytics in case of non-STMI? First, look back to the pathophysiology. I already mentioned in my lectures. Yes, sir. The the pathophysiologic process that produces subocclusive steno uh, thrombus, subloc subocclusive thrombus, is platelet rich thrombus, no fibrin, money low fibrin. It is not fibrin risk, it is platelet risk. So there is no beneficial effect in thrombolytic agent, rather, it can harm the patient. But in case of ST elevated yeah. MI, the thrombus is fib. So we can give fibrinolytic. As there is platelet release thrombus in, anti, in, in STMI, we will prescribe antiplatelet. That is important. Hardly can we can something? use anticoagulant. Yes, sir. Can I add something? Yes, sir. Look at the thrombus. Thrombus is a wall made of bricks, which are platelet, and the matrix, which is cement. The anticoagulant platelets are acting against the platelets. So anticoagulants, antiplatelets, both are antithrombotic. We can use them. But when the wall is formed, the only way to break it up is by thrombolysis. If wall is not totally formed, you should use antithrombotic, not antifibrinolytic. So thank you, sir. So another question that is also related to bleeding. The last question uh, is also related to bleeding. The patient if a non-STMI presented with hemorrhagic stroke, so what will be in that case management strategy with hemorrhagic stroke? Professor Adu Chaudhuri, first you answer this question, then I will add. <laughs> uh, the most most devastating thing we have, the after PCI, if a patient develop uh, hemorrhage, or uh, that's a that's a nightmare. Uh, the first thing is that you have to stop all antiplatelet. You have to keep statin, other drugs, supportive drugs. And you have to pray to God Almighty that He should help us. Second, 
if the bleed the amount of bleeding is important if the bleeding is less it is stopped mm -hmm. and if you have to start an antiplatelet very dearly you can start it after 7 days with caution and repeated ct or mri preferable after 15 days quite happily after 30 days but this is a gray zone depending upon every patient every the situation why the bleeding has occurred all things should be taken into consideration so may i add I a think this is word two yeah. twice Ak 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 Khaled Mose, and please add yeah. something yeah in, in this situation uh, uh, use of platelets can be useful arresting the bleeding number one and number two in this situation if we want to start an antiplatelet ticagrelor is the best choice actually because Uh, Kadindu, sir, sir. Yeah, actually, this same question was asked at the first sir. time I answered that in this session. The question was asked in intracranial hemorrhage and STMI, how will you manage? Yes, sir. I already mentioned in detail the TICA grey role, I'm useful for yes. antiplatelet, yes, general half life short. If it is small, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take interventional approach. Because interventional approach is the high risk group. Hai, but very high risk the intervention for coronary case column then we can prescribe uh, antiplatelet ticagrelol and arata aspirin the amra rekhe dite pari tahole amader hoyto benefit ta amra beshi pete pari ei bhabe amader amader ashole we have to judge the how much bleeding is there intracranial bleeding amount of bleeding and the disease severity of the coronary artery this two should be weighed and accordingly, we, we have to proceed. And definitely, antiplatelet is the ticagrelol because the half life is short. If there is increased bleeding, we can stop. The effect will disappear after 12 hours. That is very good, good option. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That is uh, every case should be individualized. I think uh, what said, every case should be individualized. Thank you, sir. Single answer Thank you, sir. cannot cover the whole thing in this situation. Right. Thank you, sir. sir. Most of the question is already discussed. I think you can proceed, sir. Thank you. Or, uh, sir, please, few words uh, uh, before ending the program. Or this, sir. Uh, what I can say, it's a wonderful session, wonderful discussion, wonderful presentation. Everybody uh, should enjoy this session. Thank you, Professor Kader, sir. You have done a very enjoyable, wonderful job. And thank you, everybody. Our faculties, our students, they have asked very part in an important question. Uh, it's a really a pleasure meeting everybody in this virtual world and enjoying the opinion of each other. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. I first thanks Professor Abdul Akunt. I have learned a lot. I think participants also learn a lot from your presentation, brilliant presentation, most elaborate, and we we have accommodated all the things in a single slide. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, participants and panelists also, and I also must thank the Incepta Pharmaceuticals. They are doing last 15 to 1 months doing a uh, tremendous job. I am sorry to say uh, my team of the Incepta, Dr. Saidur is COVID positive. His wife is COVID positive. Dr. Shorob oh, was isolation. They are last one month. I don't know. Uh, uh, I pray for all everybody in Incepta team. And uh, we have, our online class is going on, but we are everybody shocked because 50 of my, our brothers in COVID positive. Their isolations, a cardiologist. One of the my uh, younger brother in the cardiology completed a medical officer is admitted in the United Hospital. Uh, is Dubai. Uh, Dubai. Dubai. We pray for him. IPD is small. IPD is small group. We are trying to do for the our students, our colleagues. So we uh, announced yesterday. We are starting a job for the our colleagues. It is on IPDI COVID-19 initiatives. From yesterday, we have started. Everybody in the Bangladesh, just contact with us. We are with you, with our limited source. Amra achi, apna the pashe. Jodi kono amader bondhu bondhu ba kolik ra ushus to hai, amade ke ekta horse number achi, we number jana ben. Amade shadhu moto tar pashe amra thakbo. Jodi ek shadhu moto hai, amra we are starting our journey towards. Please pray for everybody. Again, thank Professor Abdul Qadir Akhund, sir. 
Thank you, so sir. Thank you, Dr. Mohsen. Thank, thank you very much for giving me the chance. But uh, if, we, if we noticed before my lecture, Dr. Khaled Mohsen, my reading partner, probably <laughs> I, I could leave the session because he's so knowledgeable man. And, and he, he <laughs> screen. Yeah, I, I, I really lucky that I did not notice him before delivering lecture. I could not complete my lecture, I am sure. The reverse <laughs> thing is that, that I am able to... Am... We can deliver lecture, but in front of such... Sir Mujinder sir, hearing... Very, very eminent faculties. Sir Mujinder... Very difficult job to deliver lecture in such situation. Very Thank you very much. Thank sir, you. Mujinder sir, Mujinder sir, heard your lecture full time, 50 minutes. Just left uh, your lecture. Just he noticed every lecture, sir. Mujinder sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you again, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, sir. Sir, sir. Our thanks and salam jain. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Our next lecture on Friday. Friday, 12th June. Shukru Bhattin, Shunda Sharashattai. Our favorite teacher, again, another teacher, Professor Adhar Ali. We missed him. Uh, he lecture on the Supra Vandik Lattaki Gardia. On Friday night, 7.30, until we say goodbye, take care, stay home. And take care. Goodbye. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, sir.